Assalamu alaikum, welcome here. Sitting on my uh, right hand side on the Christian panels, uh, right close to me, uh, Dr. John Paul Kuleski. He's a servant, uh, servant priest, professor of social ethics at Catholic Theological Union, author of 10 books including Catechetics and Prejudice, Sinai and Calvary, and some other books. He is a senior editor of Theology Review and member of the editorial board at Exploration and a few other journals. He had frequent appearance on radio and television in the United States, including ABC, CBS, and NPH, as well as many other countries. Sitting next to him, Dr. James Sheeler, Professor of Ethics of Missions and Church History, LSTC. A.D., Yale University, B.D., Th.D., Union Theological Seminary, Study Chicago, Lutheran Theological Seminary, Columbia University, International Christians, University of Japan, and Oxford. Author of several books. First one is Gospel, Church, and Kingdom. Second book, New Directions in Mission and Evangelization, volume number one. Third book, Missionary, Go Home. With this, uh, I would like to uh, start the session. Inshallah, as we said, uh, presentation by both sides will be 15 minutes for each side. So, uh, who would like to start first? I don't have a coin. <laughs> okay. not only to understand, but to protect and implement human rights wherever in the world they are being violated. For this is clearly God's will for, not only for religious communities, but for all people. One of the most important discoveries, I think, of Christian churches is how crucially important the defense of human rights, the recognition of human rights is to the life of the churches, to the faith and the practice of the churches. This is a, a recognition that has grown in the last 45 years, particularly since the adoption of the, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we have seen in the wake of that case after case of the abuse of human beings, of violation of human rights. I want to make four statements the first on the, the biblical and ethical basis of human rights in the Christian community. Second, some forms of abuse. Third, the way human rights are understood in ecumenical Christian circles, and I am speaking particularly for those member churches uh, associated with the World Council of Churches, which has more than 300 member churches throughout the world and represents some 400 million Christians living in approximately 150 different countries. And finally, some points on the implementation of human rights. First, the biblical and theological base. All human beings, regardless of race, sex, or religious beliefs, have been created by God in God's own image both as individuals and in human community. This is most firmly grounded in the very first chapter of the book of Genesis, where it says that God created human beings, male and female, in the divine image. Human beings, therefore, derive their value and their dignity from this fact that they are specially created by God to have fellowship with God, to love God with their whole being and their neighbors as themselves. This is stressed in all of the Gospels, to seek God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and in Christian love to serve one another. <clears throat> From this standpoint, therefore, the recognition and the protection of basic human rights is seen as having the greatest urgency for Christians and for churches, and is uh, 
part of the mandate which Christians receive from the Lord Jesus to proclaim divine justice, to work for peace and reconciliation at home and throughout the world. It has been our discovery that human rights cannot be separated or isolated from the larger issues of peacemaking and peacekeeping, of militarism, of ethnic cleansing, of disarmament and development. And so the fuller the rights that every person enjoys in society, the more stable that society is likely to be. I move to some forms of the abuse of human rights with which we are exam which we with which we are familiar. In our day, and as I say, particularly since World War II, when the Universal Declaration was adopted, we have seen increasing abuses, at least we are far more aware of those abuses than before, of human beings and violations of basic human rights. Individuals who are imprisoned, not for civil crimes, but for political views, persons tortured, persons held in detention for long periods, without contact with loved ones, often summarily executed without judicial proceedings. Such things are a deep offense to the conscience of Christians and of other religious communities. The pictures coming from Somalia and from the Sudan, millions of individuals, especially children, dying of starvation, needlessly deprived of food deprived of medical care when many of them could have been saved. These pictures are also a reproach to our human conscience. Thousands of refugees from Haiti, from Indochina and elsewhere, making perilous journeys by boat seeking freedom or asylum, only to be denied asylum in the country they were trying to reach and return to a threatening and dangerous situation where they become once again victims of violence. Or to take a fourth example, the threat to human life arising from population control policies, as for example in China today, where thousands of fetuses are aborted to satisfy the arbitrary population control policies of the government, where girl children are often sold, abandoned, subjected to infanticide, an extreme example of human beings deprived of the right to life and a scandal to human morality. Now let me quickly turn to the third point, and here I'm drawing upon the statements of declarations from assemblies of the World Council of Churches, especially Nairobi, 1975, and <coughs> Vancouver, 1983. The World Council has affirmed its commitment to the promotion of human rights under these categories. First, the right to the basic guarantees of life, food, shelter, health care, work, decent housing, education for the fullest development of human potential, a concern especially for these rights as they apply to women and to children, which are the most neglected. Second, the right to self-determination the right to cultural identity, the rights of minorities, for example, the right to keep one's own language and culture. Third, the right to participate in decision-making within the community. Fourth, the right to dissent and the right of dissenters to be heard and to hold opinions without interference, to freedom of expression and peaceful <coughs> assembly. We Thank God that there has been a great increase in this right, especially in Eastern Europe and in the republics that made up the, uh, the former Soviet Union in the last years. Fifth, the right to personal dignity against such gross violations and arbit as arbitrary arrest and imprisonment, torture, rape, child battery, enforced hospitalization.